Alrighty. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first generation alumni identity talk brought to you by the offices of career solutions and corporate engagement, inclusion and diversity engagement and development and alumni relations. My name is Matthew Genova and I am a junior studying cybersecurity analytics and operations and I'll be one of your moderators today. We're pleased to have you join us for this session talking about our, a first generation student. First Generation Day recognized each year on November 8th was established in 2017 by the First Generation, oops, sorry, by the Council of Opportunity and Education and the Center for First Generation Student Success to advance a national narrative of first generation experiences and outcomes, particularly the barriers facing this population and the supports necessary for first generation students to thrive. November 8th marks the anniversary of the signing of the Higher Education Act of 1965, which created a range of initiatives to expand access to higher education for low-income and first-generation students. We will begin our program in a few moments. Hello, I'm Alexander Butch. I'm the co-moderator for today's session. I'm a junior data science major. I'd like to mention that we are recording this session today. Now let's meet the panelists. First, we have Joel Gill Jr. He's a 2009 graduate of IST and he's currently a technology manager and management consultant at Grant Thornton LLP. Also on our panel today is Michelle No. She's a 2012 IST grad and a product marketing strategy lead at JP Morgan Chase. Finally, we have Steven Papino. He's a 2003 grad and a principal, principal security specialist with Salesforce. Welcome everyone, and thank you for being part of such an amazing panel. Kim is adding in our panelists' LinkedIn profiles to the chat. Now, if you could each share a little bit more about yourselves, and then we will start with some questions. Joel, we will start with you. Sure, thank you everyone. My name is Joel Gill Jr. And as mentioned before, I'm a manager and consultant at Grand Thornton where I help spearhead our agile solution offerings. Um, when I'm not helping my clients adopt Agile services, I'm often spending time with my family, uh, my wife and my 18-month-old uh, son doing fun activities. I'm also an avid cook and baker, uh, as well as an enthusiast in whiskey and wine. Um, in terms of my journey with um, my career, I've always been in the field of uh, technology. I've been a consultant for the last 12 years, supporting federal clients from uh, small companies and working up to large companies like Deloitte as well as Grant Thornton. So I'm happy to, to be here and, and share my experiences. Thank you. I can go next, sorry. Um, hi, I'm um, hi, everyone, I'm Michelle Ngo. I'm from the Philadelphia area. And as Alexander just mentioned, I'm currently a product marketing strategy lead at Chase in the Wilmington, Delaware office. I work on acquisitions marketing as well as capabilities for the Starbucks co-brand credit card. Um, my career path was a bit interesting. I did um, do some work in technology sector as a consultant as well as uh, Joel at, at Deloitte. Um, doing the business and tech implementations uh, during my, my time there. And um, outside of work, I like to learn new languages. I'm part of two different book clubs. Um, and right now I'm doing some volunteer work uh, with a, a startup. Um, so I'm looking forward to chatting more with you guys and thank you for having me today. And I'm Stephen Papino. Uh, as Alexander mentioned, I'm a 2003 graduate from IST. For those of you that know your history, you'll know that that means I was part of the first class, uh, which I say proudly, uh, came with its challenges of its own, of course. Um, one thing that it seems we all have in uh, common is that we all spent some time at Deloitte. Um, so today I am a, uh, a security specialist with Salesforce. I've been with Salesforce for a little over four years. Uh, I have the privilege to work with our customers in the public sector, specifically the Department of Defense to help them uh, securely adopt cloud technology and, and understand what software as a service is. 
Um, like Joel, I've spent the majority of my career supporting public sector customers uh, in the US. I live outside of DC in Northern Virginia. I am originally from Philadelphia as well, Michelle. Um, and I'm happy that I'm a, I'm a proud father of three young children. Uh, I have tried to stay connected to IST in the, geez, now almost 20 years since I graduated, which makes me feel fairly old now. Um, you know, having young children has made that a little difficult in recent years, uh, but happy to have reconnected and really proud to be part of this uh, identity talk today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all for uh, what incredible accomplishments you've had in your careers. Uh, just some quick housekeeping notes. If you have any questions for the panelists, please ask them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll be checking that regularly, regularly and we'll do our best to answer all of your questions. Now for the first question. What is the common struggle you notice among first year students, particularly for first generation students? I can kick off for the group. Um, for me and my first generation student friends, we struggled a lot with time management as well as having resources for our questions. Um, we couldn't ask our parents for advice since my parents didn't have the opportunity to attend college. So I was just kind of figuring out as, as I went. And later I realized that it's best to ask around until you found the answer, which would have saved me a lot of time um, during my first year at, at Penn State. So it, it took a bit of adjustment not to just like the, the campus life as, as a first generation uh, student, but also asking for help when I need it since I was so used to being very independent, um, but it takes a village. Uh, so that was kind of one of the, the common struggles that I faced. I can go next. Um, one of the challenges that I faced um, in particular was just dealing with the immense pressure for my family. Um, both of my parents obviously didn't go to school. So they basically looked at me and said, look, you need to have not just one, but two degrees. And so having to go to school and go to college, you know, you, you just feel this pressure to succeed, this pressure to, to, to do well in college. And, you know, as a freshman, I'll be honest, you know, I wanted to have fun. I was away from my parents. I wanted to play games all day and study later. But like, you know, you always hear them calling you and telling you, hey, don't forget, you need to study hard. You know, we're not putting this money for it so you can just play around. So having to, I guess, as Michelle said, balance both, uh, you know, personal life while going to school, but having to deal with that pressure from your family to actually graduate was probably my biggest challenge. And I think uh, unsurprisingly, there's a bit of a common theme here. You know, I had a, I had a challenging first semester. I won't uh, deny that it was, it was fun, great memories. I would, I would do it all over again if I could. Uh, but I think going in and being a first generation student, which, which by the way, I don't even think I remember thinking of myself as a first generation student at the time, right? I didn't know it was a, a thing. Um, but not just being a first generation student, being the first student, or the first person in my extended family to go away four years to college. Uh, I had a great support network, but again, like Michelle, <clears throat> like Joelle, I couldn't really have those conversations with my family or know what to expect. And I remember my first semester, you know, I'm a pretty social person. And so I did, I think, focus primarily on that, you know, fitting in, finding my people. And that started, um, I, I first joined uh, Club Crew, which I'd never done crew before, but I figured what the heck. Um, then I wound up quitting that, which I had never really had a history of quitting anything. And I wound up pledging a fraternity for the most of my first semester. I actually wound up quitting that at the very end of the first semester, which in hindsight was a wonderful idea. Uh, but, and my GPA wasn't that great. I mean, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say my GPA was, was like two seven or something, which was quite low and unexpected for me. And I remember having a conversation with my parents toward the end of the semester and they said, Hey, do you do you maybe want to come home? Maybe this wasn't for you to go away. Maybe you should do two years at a local campus first. But I, I, stuck it, I stuck it out and I'm happy I did. But I think the theme is there, right? Not having that embedded network to have those conversations with, to understand and set those expectations and recognizing that being a first year student is challenging no matter who you are. Going away uh, after living at home, if you, if you had that luxury is challenging. Then being a first generation student comes with its additional challenges. Um, so I think we're all on the same page there. Thank you. For our second question, we have, when you were a student, what resources did you utilize? Were the resources available specific to you as a first generation student to make that transition into college? If not, what would have been helpful to you? 
I can go first here. Um, so if there were uh, resources available to me as a first generation student, I wasn't aware of them. Um, maybe there maybe there were, it seems like there's been a lot more focus in recent years on first generation students, which I think is wonderful. Uh, I will admit that uh, I don't think I did a great job in my first years um, taking advantage of many of the wonderful uh, academic resources available to me. I think I tried to, to wing it and do it on my own. Um, I do recall, you know, I actually started in the College of Engineering, uh, and I was in that for my first two semesters before I transitioned to IST, and realized it was more in line with uh, what what drove me, what what made me feel successful, what made me happy. And I can see Joel laughing. I, I imagine a similar background. Um, but I do remember that once I joined IST, especially being part of the first class, and it was a very intimate uh, in, environment, that I did start to take more advantage of student counseling. And I think having those conversations with someone whose profession it is to help us find our way, uh, that was critical. Um, so I would certainly advocate that to anyone. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. I'm laughing because I actually started in the College of Engineering as well took a couple of classes and realized, man, this is boring. I can't do this. <laughs> but in terms of resources, um, I didn't realize there were resources geared towards first generation students. You know, like everyone, I, I you know, I sought counselship. You know, I, I had a couple of teachers that served as mentors for me. Um, but really, I just try to, like, like Steve said, wing it. Like, I just figure I navigate it. Um, but one thing I did do prior to even coming to college, I was strategic with the campus that I chose. Um, I didn't know how I would do when I'm being apart from my family. Um, I figured I was independent, but I wasn't quite sure. So I, I went to a smaller campus. I was closer to where I reside. I, I'm from New York City. And so I figured, oh, a two hour drive isn't too bad. Let me go there for two years and then see how I do. And then once I get acclimated to living on my own, then I'll transfer up to Maine. So that was probably one thing I did prior to coming to college. But in terms of the resources, I wasn't aware. I just try to basically rely on the new friendships that I made while I was there during my first year, as well as the counselors, counselors and mentors that I, I found at Penn State. And I kind of was in the same boat as Steve. I, I don't think it was a thing back then. I didn't know, you know, like first generation students was, was really a thing. Um, but the resources I utilized the most was, um, I was at main campus for all four years. And sometimes being at such a large university, it, it, it's very overwhelming. There's a lot of resources out there, but it's just getting in touch and finding them. Um, so I think the one I would say I utilized the most was probably the, the free tutoring. Um, I was on scholarship, so I couldn't really afford to let my grades slip. And I needed a lot of help coming from an inner city uh, school in Philadelphia. Um, you know, they do the best they can, but it wasn't the best education. So I felt that I wasn't at the level compared to others, um, my peers in, in classes. So um, it's also a different time. You know, in 2008, I had to look at bulletin boards. I know they don't use that anymore, or they'll make announcements in class. And um, I know we're at an age now where everything is digital and social media, and they can just tweet it out or put it on Instagram. But back in the day, we had to go through the commons at the library and kind of like find all the flyers that, that's posted on, on the bulletin just to see like free tutoring, you know, like go to, um, you know, go to this uh, buildings that you can get more education um, or help with your classes. And what I noticed as well is though it's not first generation, I noticed that the others um, that were also doing tutoring were first generation students. So it seems like we, we needed a little bit more support um, than, than our other peers. So it's probably the one I utilized the most was just tutoring because it was free. Awesome, thank you so much guys for sharing. Um, on to the next question though. Uh, how did you learn about the various social and extracurricular aspects of college? Um, yeah, I'll kick, I'll kick off. Um, for, for me, at least, um, specifically was, was word of mouth. Like I mentioned, you know, uh, social media was, I think there was like Facebook, but, you know, we, we still was like, it was like almost 15 years ago. So it was a bit of an adjustment compared to today. So there, you know, I hung out with a lot of people from uh, my dormitory with, uh, at Penny Packer. And if one person finds out something, they spread it across the floor. And then the next thing you know, is throughout the whole, uh, the whole building. So um, that was one aspect was just word of mouth. And second was the hub. You walk through the hub and then that's where you got most of the information of the social activity. So um, those are probably my, my main two like sources. Uh, 
I, I can go next. Um, yeah, I'm I'm a social creature by nature. Uh, I know that you know uh, some people in IST and, and they and, and other majors opt to live, for instance, on the special interest floors, and and I specifically did not to do that. Again, I mean, I didn't start in IST. I started in engineering, but for me, uh, advice that I sometimes give to folks is sometimes it, it helps to have uh, kind of varying uh, groups or varying networks to be associated with. And so for me, uh, I kind of went about it in two different ways to find out about extracurriculars. If it was academic related, of course, those are conversations or resources I would seek out in class or, you know, um, during study sessions or things of that nature. But other than that, again, yeah, word of mouth, you know, in my dorm, uh, I was in East Halls as well in gearing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wanted to make sure to be involved with extracurricular activities across the spectrum. So I got involved with intramural sports, um, with volunteer opportunities. I probably should have done a little more than I did, but I, I never, you know, was at a lack of, of something to do. I was always busy. Uh, but I do think that getting involved with extracurriculars, whether they're academic or social extracurricular, I think, um, I think it goes a long way. Yeah, similar to what Steve and Michelle said, um, it's word of mouth. Um, but we also had fairs, I think, in the beginning of this of the of the semester. And so, you know, every club had like a stand and basically would go there and, and inquire about what they do. And you get pamphlets. I don't I know what, what are pamphlets, right? <laughs> I'm dating myself here. <laughs> but um basically that was basically the way that we got information about the, the different activities. And so I would talk with some of my roommates who were also involved. They were um, sophomores at the time. And so, you know, they were involved. And so I said, hey, well, hey, you know, we're roommates. I might as well just link up with you guys and do what you do. So that's how I basically got involved with the social and extracurricular activities. I completely forgot about those, Joel. Thanks for reminding me. We did have those there. <laughs> so just walk around and grab all the papers that you can. <laughs> yeah. All right. So for our next question, we have, were you aware of scholarship opportunities at Penn State? And if so, how were you made aware of them? And then Michelle, I heard you mention you were on scholarship. So maybe we kind of you start, please. Yeah, um, though I was on scholarship, it covered most of the tuition, but junior and senior year, I lived off campus. So I still needed some additional money to help me out with living expenses for food. And I went through my advisor first at the College of IST, um, setting up calls just to see if there's any opportunities out there. But again, at such a large university, it's very competitive and you can fill out the essays, but just being selected and awarded for additional scholarships was a bit difficult. Um, there is like a site I think on, I don't know why I didn't go there, but yeah, like ist.psu.edu um, slash like scholarships where they kind of list it. Um, but yeah, didn't find myself the best writer. So I, I did put in a few essays, but <laughs> I guess compared to like maybe tens of thousands of other people that applied for those scholarships, um, it's just, just very competitive to, to obtain. Um, it's, fun. it's funny. I probably took the lazy right, the lazy way out. Um, I didn't apply for as much counselors as I probably should have. Um, especially it hurt me more when I had to transition from the smaller campus to Maine, which is much more expensive. And I was already out of state, so you know, add that on top of it. Um, but I, I didn't know that there was. I, I didn't know there were scholarships available. I think I just was like, you know what. I don't got time for that. I got to do other things. And so in hindsight, it's probably, uh, probably a wise move. I just took advantage of what was offered and, and be more aggressive and apply for more scholarships. So first I'll echo what Michelle mentioned about uh, the resource that IST, um, that IST provides. It's something that I came across recently. So I think that's critically uh, valuable. I, I have a little bit of a unique background here. Um, I hope I'm not making a, an inappropriate assumption, but I would imagine there is some kind of correlation between socioeconomic status with your family and being a first generation student. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have a hard life growing up, but you know, we, we lived, I think a typical middle-class upbringing. And uh, you know, we knew from early on that um, sending me to four years of, of college while the national debt crisis wasn't quite what it is today. It was certainly starting to become at the forefront of the conversation. And, you know, we recognize, look, we don't want to start with that much debt, right? Let's limit our debt as much as possible coming out of college, uh, which is something I would advocate to anyone. Uh, so I was very fortunate in that 
know, 12 or 13 years old. I knew I already wanted to go to Penn State. I mean, I just knew it probably from watching football, um, just being in the state of Pennsylvania. It was, it was not even a question. And so I was very fortunate. I'll thank her till the, the day I, I no longer have the ability to. My mom was looking for a new job uh, around the time I was entering high school. And we lived near Penn State, Delaware County, which was called at the time. Now it's Penn State Brandywine. And they were hiring. And so she said, hey, if you're serious about going there, I'll, I'll consider it. You know, And the pay wasn't as great, but the benefits were wonderful, including 75% off core tuition. And so she was fortunate enough to get that job. I was fortunate enough for her to get it. Um, and she actually wound up working, of all places, in the financial aid office within admissions. And so I was very fortunate that she knew, uh, not that we received special treatment, but she knew how to, how to identify and get access to those resources. And so that was, I was very lucky for that. And I'll never forget that. Um, it was a creative way to solve a difficult challenge of uh, being a first-generation student. And the other thing I'll mention is don't just limit the scholarships you look at to what's provided by the university. Um, I'd be lying if I said I remembered all the scholarships I went after. I'll claim age there. It's, it's been a while. Uh, but I remember that I was fortunate enough to get a small scholarship from my local community. Um, so totally unaffiliated with Penn State. Uh, I'm an Italian-American, and there was a local Italian-American club, and uh, I applied for a scholarship there, and I was fortunate enough to get it all four years. Um, so I think understanding that there are resources both at the university, certainly provided directly by the College of IST, but also in your community, um, explore all the options available to you. Yeah, and a lot of corporate, I think, organizations, um, maybe like Starbucks or, or McDonald's, you know, like they're supporting their employees, like helping them pay for college. It's completely different than when, when we were attending school. So I think, you know, just knowing how important education is, like these corporate organizations also notice that and realize like they're investing in their employees. You know, if I'm helping you out with, with college that maybe, you know, maybe you want to come work in, in the corporate office. So, you know, to Steve's point, just not looking solely on, on IST, but also like outside resources as well. And one other thing I'll add that just, I was just reminded of, um, I, I think it was, I think it started in my sophomore year. There was a really unique, well, I'll call it unique, scholarship kind of put forth by the Pennsylvania state government. Um, at the time, there was a bit of a brain drain in the state and they wanted to keep technology jobs in the state. And so they launched a scholarship, a little, it's a little complicated. They launched a scholarship, which basically had some, some key requirements. And those requirements included uh, having an internship in the state um, and then working in the state after graduation for as many years as you received the scholarship. Again, the idea was to retain IT talent uh, and it was smart. Uh, the challenge was though, that when I graduated, there weren't a ton of IT jobs, at least none that I could, could find, which is eventually why I went out of state. Unfortunately, and I knew this going into it, that scholarship turned into a loan. Um, that was kind of the downside and the risk to it. But I thought it was creative, right? It was, um, again, a very specific requirement baseline with uh, a, a, an intended goal. Um, in the end, I didn't meet all those requirements, but that's okay. Uh, so again, yeah, look, look for all those uh, various resources available to you. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, definitely gave a lot of helpful uh, um, information about scholarships. And as a first generation student, I definitely feel like I should get on top of that as well. <laughs> um, but on to the next question. Um, how, did, how did you guys know what major you wanted to pursue? Uh, Steve, I remember you mentioned earlier that uh, you actually did not, uh, was in an IST. Uh, for, you were actually an engineering major. So what was your thought process behind that? Um, I know you delved um, a little, uh, you, you talked a, a little about that, but would you wanna talk about your process and like, I guess um, your, sure. your, your thought process, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I really gave up on the idea of being an astronaut till I was about 18, 19. And quite honestly, I really haven't still given up on it. I'll find a way. Uh, you know, especially with all these opportunities, but I just got to make a lot more money. Um, so yeah, g going into Penn State, uh, I wanted to do aeronautical engineering. In fact, I almost went to a school in Florida, Embry-Riddle, 
which uh, focuses on uh, uh, aeronautical engineering. Um, and so in, in going that route, I think like Joel had kind of mentioned, I imagine a somewhat similar uh, experience, I wasn't finding happiness in engineering. I mean, I know I was only in it for a semester or two, I think it was two semesters, but I quickly realized, and I've subsequently, even up till recently, had similar conversations with, with my peers, and, and I'm confident I made the right choice. My feeling was that it's all about knowing yourself and what drives you, what your inherent skill sets are, and just kind of letting that uh, lead you. For me, what drives me, I found, was um, near-term, short-term uh, byproducts, right? Seeing the impact of my work quickly. I don't do well in working on something for months and years at a time, only to find out that it's not even going to be used, right? So I'll give an example. In aeronautical engineering, let's say you wind up working on a NASA program, right? Uh, going back to the moon, right? The program that is, is now up and running, but was previously canceled years ago. Uh, those individuals, they, they put in some really great work only to find out that that program would not, was not viable and was, was canceled. That would be devastating to me uh, as a professional. Uh, in IT, uh, I suspected, and I've subsequently found it to be true, whether I was developing software, right? And I could quickly develop a widget in a number of hours and, and see it in, in action. Or if I was building um, an IT architecture and I could see folks start to implement that IT architecture or, you know, as high level as developing IT strategy, right? And I've been involved in all three of those. And again and again, seeing the, the fruit of my effort quickly have impact was critical for me. And that's what, what really drove me to IST. And then also you just kind of have to follow what you're good at. Um, when I graduated, uh, my first job that I landed was a software developer. And I never intended to be a software developer. And I thought, oh, I'm going to fail at this. But I was good at it. Uh, and, and I just kind of let that lead me. Um, and I think those are key things, right? Knowing what you're good at and understanding what drives you and, and just follow it from there. Go ahead, Joel. I know you guys kind of have similar background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, so I, I actually came to Penn State because of the College of Engineering program at the time. I think it was ranked. You know, um, I was I went to high school strictly for music. Yes, I went to the Fame High School. In case you're wondering, and I knew at my senior year, look, I'm not going to be a starving artist. I got a lifestyle I want to live, and being a musician will not cut it for me, especially with digital and CDs and all that other stuff and DJs. That's not going to happen. And so when I was at the when I was at the College of Engineering for like I think a year, first year, I guess. I realized I didn't want to be in a cubicle all day, face down, looking at stuff and, and not having a social aspect to it all. And so I was talking to different professors and at the campus that I was in, Schuylkill campus, the head of the IC department there was really trying to build up that program. And she was a bit of a salesperson and she sold me on the idea of that, look, you can do consulting, you can do all these different things. Uh, with IST, just come on, give us a look. Just come on down and join us. You know, it almost almost seemed a little cultish to me, but um, I'm glad that she did recruit me a little hard to like kind of try out the program, and I'm glad that I did. So um, I, I've I never looked back ever since. Um, <laughs> um, but one thing I will tell, one thing I will say, um, when I declare before I declared my major, I was tussling between IST and MIS, and that same professor said to me, "Look, get the IST degree." get your master's or get an MBA. And I said, you know what? That's probably the best advice I've ever heard. <laughs> and that's what I eventually did, so. Yeah, I had a different path. I actually came in uh, to Penn State undecided. And it's interesting because I was surrounded by a lot of people that picked their major engineering, um, you know, like biobehavioral health. They, they had a path that they thought they knew they wanted to do. And then sophomore year, they were either changing it. Or they realized, you know, freshman year, first semester, this, these aren't the courses that I wanted to take. Um, so I came in undecided because at 17, 18 years old, you know, you're a freshman. Yeah, you want to be a doctor. You want to, you know, like uh, be an astronaut. You know, there's different things that, that you think you want to do, but that'll change, especially at such a young age. So I, I went in undecided. I, we, we have the options of, of having electives. So it's not like you're going to be off course with your four year uh, for graduation. Um, so I spoke to an advisor and she encouraged me to take this 
I don't know if it was cultish, like come, same thing as Joelle mentioned, but yeah, it was like, hey, there's this introductory like ISC course. I was also leaning towards M MIS because, you know, I was kind of looking at what would give me a job after graduation, what pays well. Um, so I took the introductory course uh, with one of my friends and we actually enjoyed it. It was very unique and it, 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 it seemed like it fit. Um, and there was three different paths at the time. I'm not sure if they changed it now, but you kind of can go that coding path or that, you know, more of the functional business role uh, or something um, that kind of in between. Um, so I ended up choosing the one that was more of like the functional role because I would love to have cold, but it does not come easily to me. And as Steve mentioned, sometimes, you know, do what you're really good at. So more from the, the business and consulting aspect uh, versus me as a software engineer things would break if, if that, that was me in charge of it. So kind of went that path and ended up, um, it, it was good, a good choice because a lot of people, at least uh, the ones that were in my building, uh, they were all like, like uh, I think it was like HHD, um, BBH, like biobehavioral health. It was like a huge population, but then with IST, it was kind of niche at the time. Like not a lot of people were in there. Um, so me being a, a minority and also a minority as a woman in IST, since there weren't a lot of us at the time, um, it, it gave me the opportunity to, to stand out, uh, learn something new, um, since it was predominantly men um, in that college. So I did land a job after graduation. I graduated on, on time. So I do not regret that at all. I think IST was the, the perfect choice for me. Yeah, I actually was so trendy too. It was like the new kid on the block. I mean, when I was there, it was like that. Oh, look at the sexy building over at Atherton over there. And it's like, yeah, that's where I go to school. That's where I take my classes. And also, that's why I have Fridays off. I don't have to work, go to class on Fridays. <laughs> that's like, so true. <laughs> oh, my friends were jealous. They were like, wow, like you, you don't have to, you know, like I think we had a, a, a nice flexible schedule. Yeah. Um, our classes was always group work. So they were... Um, it, yeah, I noticed that as well. Like IST was a lot of group work and I, I leveraged that even to the today. And I noticed like my other friends who were in different majors didn't really have as much experience as I did. So like I easily knew how it was to kind of coordinate schedules. Like theirs was a bit siloed in their majors. So I think it was a lot of like benefits being, being in IST um, at that time and even now. Thank you. So, oh. Steve, did you have something to add? No, no. Okay, so uh, before our next question, I, this is one of the big students for myself, Matthew, and then any students in the audience, but I wanna remind you, you all that we do have the Q&A. So if you wanna add any questions in there, but this is a big one for us students. So we have, how have past internships helped you with future opportunities? And what advice do you have to students who are looking for an internship? And do you have any helpful tips for networking? And then, Joelle, it is still, uh, still a flex that we get to use the Westgate building, so maybe we could start with you for this one. Well, <clears throat> I will say that in terms of internships, and that's a loaded question, um, I only had one internship experience at Penn State. Others had like two or three, so I wasn't as fortunate, um, and part of it was because I didn't realize how important internships were until I had to prepare myself for, for um, graduation. And so um, I, what I will say is in terms of internships, one of the biggest advice I'll say is, first of all, definitely do your research, apply, and try try everything, right? If you can start interning at, a, at, a, at you know as a rising sophomore, do it because you know you'll have all these different experiences it looks you build up your resume you're building up experience and you get to know what you do and don't like to do so unfortunately I had one internship experience I was a tester and I realized I hated testing and so of course when I would apply for these jobs all of them were testing roles I'm like I really don't want to do this <laughs> And so had I maybe been exposed to other different internship opportunities, I would have probably realized, you know, well, maybe testing is the way to go, or maybe I need to develop my skills as a coder or do something different. And so it would have given me some knowledge as to where I wanted to take my career path for sure. Uh, I'll jump in there. Um, so my experience, I think, I think was unique, uh, like Joelle, and maybe this is a byproduct of, again, being a first-generation student and not having anyone kind of whispering in your ear, hey, you might want to do this. Um, I only had one internship, uh, and it was uh, the summer of junior year. Um, I think that, you know, as, as Michelle had mentioned, IST, great with group work, and um, even, even dating back to the first class. I mean, we didn't have a ton of corporate involvement, but Lockheed Martin was very present, uh, and a few others. And so I remember kind of 
making uh, an assumption or a judgment. Oh, well, I, I want to work for a big corporation in my internship and be with other IST students, right, working as a team. And that was kind of my measure, I think, uh, subconsciously of um, success. And I was striking out. I was striking out when I was looking uh, for junior year. And it was only because of my connection with one of my professors. Uh, he connected me. It didn't sound glamorous at all with the Center County Historical Society. And they had a very outdated website and they needed someone to update the website. And he knew the people that worked there. He had done some work for them in the past and, and he hooked me up. So I'm thinking, all right, I'm doing this internship with this historical society in Center County, not at all the experience I wanted. Plus I'm gonna wind up doing like development work and, and I had the integration option. Again, kind of this, this development thing is a little bit of a theme for me early on in my career. And I was just like thinking, wow, this, this is not what I anticipated, but I need it for graduation, so I'll do it. In hindsight, it was the absolute best experience I could have had. And I can tie a lot of my successes back to it. I wound up essentially being an independent consultant. I wound up working remotely uh, long before COVID. You know, I, um, I built out my, my requirements. I did the development. I presented to the customer. It was wonderful. Uh, and I learned a new skill set, right? I had developed in PHP. I had no PHP experience before that. But it was all of the things that I think this major prepares you for, right? Uh, adapting to new technology, uh, interacting with customers, um, kind of pivoting and, and being, you know, um, just, just being able to work kind of in any environment, which is critical for today. And so I would, I would say leverage, leverage your resources again, right? Take the unconventional path. Career fairs are great, but everyone's going to career fairs, right? Take the unconventional path. Don't make prejudgments. Don't think that something isn't glamorous. It, it might wind up being wonderful. Uh, but definitely, I think, something that I wish I had known then, go after internships your first summer. I mean, you know, starting your freshman year, don't be afraid to go to career fairs. Don't be afraid to start looking then because I think that'll give you varying experiences. I mean, as you all said, you might not want to be a tester, um, but if you're a tester one year and you're uh, integration another year, and then you're working on policy another year, you've got three great varying experiences and, and that'll kind of inform your decisions moving forward. Yeah, and piggybacking off of that, I completely agree. I think a lot, there were, you know, it was a mixed class. So some people kind of waited to their junior year to find um, find that internship, maybe to line up for a full-time offer role, but you, you kind of need to set yourself up for success. So like the sooner you can put more internships on your resume, learn skill sets, learn what you do and don't like, I think that'll better help you for the full-time role. Um, I had a lot of jobs, like even before I came to, to Penn State, like I was like a, a cashier at CBS. I worked at McDonald's. I was a sales associate. I worked at a factory. So like, you know, you name it, I've, I've probably done it before. And that's different than an internship. You know, like I'm not saying those aren't transferable skills. I think being able to work with people and even doing like grunt labor work um, does help out, but it doesn't translate well on the resume. So when I got to Penn State, I tried to uh, look for, for jobs and Sometimes it's unfortunate, you know, they look on your, your resume and they're kind of looking for that brand name. They're not really looking at like, you know, well, I have this experience or I could learn and, you know, I'm, I'm able to, to roll my sleeves up and, and do the work, but it might not be in a corporate setting. Um, maybe it's different now, but at the time it was very hard for me to go to these career fairs and land an interview. So um, I ended up taking, yeah, unconventional paths. And at the time I do kind of regret, um, I was a bit like, I needed money um, as well just to support myself. Um, so I wasn't, if I saw unpaid, I'm like, I'm not taking that unpaid internship. No, you need to pay me something. Um, but that really wasn't the right approach because it's an investment at the end of the day. So if there is an opportunity, maybe for a nonprofit organization where you are gonna be able to get those skill set, it still looks great on the resume. Um, try not to think about it all the time, like money, 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 like the money will come and it will set you up, you know, to probably get the next opportunity if you, if you have that. Um, so don't say, say no, just because there's not like a, a huge dollar amount next to it, just figure out what you're going to get out, out of that situation. Um, and I would say for, for um, like networking and, and tips on that is um, it was, it was surprise you how many people don't follow up. So if you're, if you meet someone um, even at a career fair, you know, uh, they don't do business cards anymore, but yeah, like send your thank you notes, like make sure you're following up. Um, if you have like their email address, ask for a 15, 20 minute coffee chat. You never know how far that would go. Cause there's many times where, um, you know, someone said to me like, 
wow, like I'm, I'm surprised I heard from you. Usually people just like come up to me and they find out that they don't, um, you know, I don't have a job for them right away that they just, you know, they don't respond back or they don't care to, to still stay in contact with me. Um, we have LinkedIn now, so you can always like make that connect and, and people will set, you know, like they're very kind. Like if you want to say a 15 minute coffee chat, um, definitely set one up, but don't go in there without an agenda, like, like have something structured so you can navigate those 15 minutes to the best of your, your ability and see what you want to get out of it. So, you know, whether it's something, learning something new about the industry, like um, tech or marketing, or, you know, something about business, asking someone like what career path did they take to, to get them to, to where you're also interested in. Um, so yeah, just don't say no to an opportunity and kind of like judge everything um, just based on what you, you think. Um, people are willing to, to help you if you ask. Absolutely. And, and one thing I wanted to um, uh, bring up, because I think um, someone remembered me from my days at um, ISD, I was a, I guess, teaching intern or a learning assistant. I don't know, well, I don't know what it was called, but I worked closely with a professor, Dr. Irene Patrick, who's extremely instrumental in my growth and my development. The biggest thing I took from her, and this is one thing that I think a lot of students in her class struggled with, and I understood why she stressed this, Whenever she would ask a question, she didn't want to regurgitate in information. She wanted insight. And that's super important. I didn't realize how important and valuable that was until I got into the professional realm. When, when someone's asking you a question, they don't just want you to spit like straight facts, right? They want you to provide some in-depth analysis, some something, something that shows that you've been thinking about this and stewing on it long and long, long, you know, you know, before you even answer the question. And so working with her directly gave me that confidence. Um, whenever I would be, whenever I'm asked a question that I've already done the research, I've already done some analysis, I've done, I was proactive, you know, it's, it wasn't just strictly remembering what I read somewhere, but it was also just to chew on it, think critically, and even question. So that's, that was one thing that I definitely took from Dr. Um, Irene Patrick when I was working closely with her as a teaching intern. And I'm glad that I had that opportunity because that definitely, you know, shaped how I navigated my career moving forward. Sorry, I know we're short on time. Like uh, two last things I was gonna uh, mention is that, you know, like to, again, I was talking about like setting your, yourself up for success, like outside of just like to get you to the internships, like what, what Alexander and Matthew is doing now, like volunteering, like finding these opportunities to do, to do public speaking, being involved, finding um, a, a leadership role, even in social, um, social clubs that also can benefit you because it's, it's not easy, you know, like walking up in, in career fairs and feeling very comfortable in, in what you're talking about, but it comes with experience. So, you know, if, if you are taking these opportunities, when it does come time to look for internships, you kind of already have that network and, and speaking to a lot of other, other folks to get you there. And then the second one, which I wish I did more when I was at university is just um, finding a mentor, like, having someone that's there to support you and give you the advice, um, they, it comes with experience. So, you know, whether it's a professor, an advisor, someone on, on campus, um, but I, I think just having the support system around you at, at especially some, a place big as Penn State, it definitely can, can help out a lot. And I'll add, since we're all adding kind of one more thing, I'll add uh, one more thing here. I don't think this advice even stops when you graduate. Um, I know, for instance, when I was at Penn State, I focused a lot on, I mean, I, I did my job in the classroom, right? I wound up with a good GPA, got my degree, and that was kind of my focus. I didn't really think about uh, some of the other things we're talking about today. And other than that, I was very social in nature, right? Um, outside of IST, but once I graduated, uh, I then realized, you know, I can still create that network that maybe I didn't create as strongly as when I was at IST. Again, I was part of the first class. Um, so those that were part of the first class all were pretty, pretty intimately connected. But I started, I joined two semesters late. So I was kind of just always on the cusp of that, that group. Um, but when I graduated, they were starting up the Alumni Society, the IST Alumni Society. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do what I didn't do when I was at school. I'm going to get really involved with IST here from an extracurricular perspective. And I wound up being the first vice president and subsequently the second president. And that allowed me to sit on the IST, uh, the, the board with a lot of really high up corporate folks and, and make some unique connections I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. 
Um, and so I think always look for those opportunities, whether it's while you're a student, uh, as an alumni, or in the corporate world. Uh, it's, it's always the same story, quite frankly. Thank you everyone for sharing. Um, but uh, I have, I just got a question right here. Um, it uh, says, what support would you have liked to see in the College of ISC that wasn't available at the time? Uh, Michelle, I know you briefly talked about um, having a support system with uh, advisors or mentors. Uh, did you want to go dive in a little deeper about that? Uh, was that not available at the time or um, were there other things that you wish that you had or uh, to help support you in the College of ISC? Yeah, um, I'm also very accountable. So I'll be very honest, like it, it's on me. It's on me at the end of the day. I think those resources are there and they do their their best. But, you know, being a first generation students and um, going to social events or like, you know, like parties and trying to balance like classes, um, I think sometimes in terms of prioritizing um, at, su at such a young age, like I'm not really, I'm thinking of getting a job, but I didn't really think about, you know, like all this stuff um, to, to get me there. Cause I didn't know, <laughs> um, you know, maybe if I had like um, my, my parents were a bit more like educated in that area and they can like, you know, m you see it on TV a lot, right. Or it, like some of my friends, like their, their dad has the experience. So he's encouraging his daughter um, or, or his son to, to say, Hey, like, make sure you go talk to this. And she wasn't taking the advice. She was one of like, <laughs> like people I was coming across. But um, for me, I do think uh, the, the resources were, were there. Um, they tried their best to, to make those announcements, but sometimes when they're at events and I do attend it, it's a low attendance rate, um, which is very unfortunate because they put together as, as even with today, like such great events, um, it's just making sure to, to go there. So I think, you know, if I could do things differently um, in that area, I would have just attended more um, events, try to make those connections and, and network. Um, you hear it all the time, like networking is so important, but what does that really mean? And I think it's a different path for, for each person. Um, I've been very fortunate to, to make connections even through small interactions uh, with folks, but making yourself kind of like memorable, um, it, it goes a long way. And just like, like I said, those follow-up emails and, and messages like matters a lot. Um, something as small as, you know, instead of watching, um, now you guys have streaming services. So instead of watching like a, a, like a Netflix show, um, you can set up that 15 minutes out your day to kind of like maybe bi-weekly once a month um, to still have those connections. And, you know, I see on the, on the chat as well, like we, we even have like a alumni mentoring um, programs as well. So I think the resources are there. It's just doing your research and um, like going to your advisor and just trying to see like, well, I don't really know. And I feel like it might be out there. Like, how can you connect me or where, where should I go for, for the next steps? I think the one thing I'll add, and I'm not sure if this was offered at, at, at the time I was at Penn State or is it offered now, but if you can find some research in terms of how to develop professionalism, um, and I say that because I had, when I was an internship, when I was, when I was an intern, I had a little small, I did a small gesture um, that didn't harm anyone. I mean, it was something that I did because I was an urban city youth. I, I wore a certain piece of clothing and someone who obviously was of a different race and culture asked me, what was it? And you know, I answered the question, it's like, hey, you know, I'm, I, I usually do this for my hair. And then the next day I got pulled aside by someone that worked at the company and said, hey, we don't do that here. And I just thought like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> this, was, this wasn't even at work. This was like an outside event and half hour. And the one thing he taught me was just because you're in an event with coworkers outside of work doesn't mean they're not watching. And it blew my mind because I thought, well, I'm professional from eight to five, not realizing, you know, if you're in front of your coworkers and colleagues, it's, you always have to be professional. And that was one of the biggest lessons, the hardest lessons I had to learn. But I was fortunate that someone was willing to pull me aside and tell me that. And something so innocent as putting on a piece of fabric, right, you know, just apparently, you know, could have been seen the wrong way and possibly offended or even scared someone even though it was totally harmless and so if you can find you know what again I don't know if there's a professionalism course but maybe just doing your research on like what to do when you get into a professional setting because it's a lot different than when you walk into a classroom you know I know 
there's probably this taboo, but there's politics involved in every company that you go, you need to be able to understand, you know, what the politics are like and, you know, what are, what are things that you do and things that you say versus things that you don't say and things that you don't do, because it will, it will help you for the longevity of your career. Now, again, I, I don't know if this is a touchy subject, but I figured, Hey, if you're, if you're looking to be in a professional professional, you have to know this, you're going to learn this sometime or the other It's best that you hear it now before you actually have to learn a hard lesson like I did. That really just made me think of something, Joel, as you mentioned that. Yes. So Matthew, back to your question. Um, Again, being first generation and, you know, I'm also like a a daughter of an immigrant. Like she doesn't know the corporate setting. So how I was speaking, how I was dressing, um, I was professional, but I didn't know certain attire. And I saw, I see photos and I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, why did I wear that? You know, it was like, even though it was like a button up, I didn't know maybe like a blazer would have looked nice or just, um, yes, I hopefully no one sees those photos ever but yeah like I think having a course or having someone kind of either pull you aside or or tell you like you know like how you present yourself matters a lot and and what people think because they might be so distracted on on what they think you should be dressed like or look like or speak um how you're speaking that they're they're not really focused on 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 the great work that you're doing um so appearances it's unfortunate but yes appearances do do matter and and um I had a very I was coming from the inner city so I had a a uh, very strong Philadelphia accent um, that I had to like watch out that I'm using certain terminology that the, it's it's only local and you know maybe someone in in the office who might be from a different state was like what are you saying like I don't I don't understand you but in my head because you know I, it makes sense to me and then I also did not and I could have done things differently in terms of expanding my network I was hanging out with a lot of people from Philly so if I'm hearing it all the time and I'm not talking to someone from California or for Texas on my campus, then I may not know that I sound different, you know, to them if everyone around me. So, um, yeah, I think that's one thing that I probably, if there was like a course uh, to try to help, help people like, you know, <laughs> help people like us out. I, I think it, I, I, I still ended up, you know, in a great place, but yeah, definitely a lot of lessons learned along the way. The, the Philly accent topic really speaks to me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think being a part of the first class of IST, the two biggest resources I wish we had, and we just we just didn't, were alumni, right? We didn't have a we didn't have an alumni base. There were no alumni, um, and industry recognition of what the heck IST was, because that was really uh, interesting. When we would go on interviews, we had to first spend the first like five ten minutes educating educating the interviewers on what IST was and what it was we were trying to do and things of that nature. And so I think that students today, I certainly don't want to just make assumptions, but I've seen it firsthand. You certainly have the alumni network and IST has been very successful. Industry knows what IST is, um, but I think it's still on you to to have a good elevator pitch. Um, so, so I think that those resources, as, as Michelle said, as Joel said, they're there. Uh, taking advantage of them is, is up to you. Uh, Joelle had mentioned in the chat, creating a good connection with at least one professor. I was fortunate enough to do that with the professor of my capstone class, Jim Jansen. He's not at IST anymore, but you know, he was on my Christmas card list for years. Um, we stayed connected. Uh, we're still connected. Uh, we chat every now and then. But I reached out to him for years when I was looking to switch jobs. Hey, I wanted to, to bounce this off you. What do you think? And um, he was just always my go-to resource. And so I think the resources are there, uh, leverage them. I'm not sure if we have time for one last question or we time check. Good. All right. I got one more, I have one more question. And this is kind of piggybacking off what Steve said with um, like resources that are available. So, sorry, I got scrolled. Here we go. So we have to understand the hurdles to overcome in reaching students. Can you tell us about what kept you from making use of support that existed in IST, but that you didn't take advantage of? Yeah, I'll go first there. I mean, honestly, for me, I'll, I'll take the hit on that. It was my own doing. Um, I think, at least me, when I was at Penn State, I had a very near-term focus, right? I, I thought about uh, how my grades were this semester. 
Um, I, I was pretty good at planning out my, my curriculum. I graduated with the exact amount of credits just because I'm overly meticulous, but I didn't really have those kind of two, five, 10 year goals in mind. Once I graduated, like that's how I live my life. I mean, I'm always kind of setting and refreshing and, and achieving or shooting to achieve the goals that I've laid out both near, mid and, and long term. I didn't have that perspective uh, when I was in school. I think it's it's not something maybe that comes natural to you when you're younger, per se, um, assuming that you are, you know, kind of following the traditional path to university. Uh, so I, I think that that's critical, right? Had I, I have to believe, had I thought more about, okay, wh what, what are my end goals here, right? What am I looking to achieve? What are my successes um, that I probably would have taken more advantage of those resources? Uh, one thing I can say I was really successful at was being social and creating a network and having, creating lifelong friends. Um, that I was, I was very focused and very successful at. But I think taking advantage of the academic resources that were available to me, while I did just fine, I think I could have done a lot more. Um, so it was really just taking that initiative and having that outlook. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback. Um, for me, I felt like, hey, I'm a pretty smart guy. You know, I'll figure it out. Um, and I, um, I, I'll, I'll mention this. Um, I mentioned this before the call. But um, I had to get to a place where I, I couldn't do it myself to realize I need resources and I need to leverage the community and the, the, the staff. And I'll share this story real quickly. Um, I graduated with a, a GPA that was above Dean's list and I didn't have a job and I was frustrated. And I remember sitting and thinking, what am I doing wrong? I've gotten these, I've went on interviews, didn't get any, any hits, didn't get any offers. And so I went to Madhavi, probably a little angry, but not towards her. And I said, Madhavi, look, I, I'm, I graduated. I have nothing lined up. Can you help me? <laughs> and she was so kind and, and did her magic. And I landed a job because she did her magic. And so I think that's when I realized, look, you can't always do things by yourself. You need to leverage the resources that are available to you. You have to, you know, work with folks and the connections that you make in order to to, to achieve your goals. And had I not um, reached out to Madhavi and said, can you help me? I would have been back at home with my parents and looking to go to grad school, which is something I did not want to do at that time. So um, I'm glad that I did, but you know, just you might have to just put your, your own pride and maybe your ego aside and, and say, look, I can use any resources that are available to me, even if I may not need them right now. It's good just, just to know that they're available so that if I use them down the line or if someone else needs them, they can leverage them. So. Yeah, um, I also agree. I think the resources are there, but it's just being, you know, taking that initiative and then leveraging, you know, like maybe start with your advisor, uh, Madhavi, you know, Rita, like people that we have on this call um, to, to say what you're looking for and they'll connect you to the right uh, people. Um, also, like, I don't know if it's just me, but I didn't even know, this sounds really ridiculous. I didn't know about grad school. I heard some people talk about it in other majors, but to me, my mom just told me, um, just, just go to, to college. I, so when I hear people go to grad school, I'm like, why would people still go to grad school? I ended up getting my MBA. Um, so yeah, I think just also like being more educated and, and kind of like knowing what your, your path is. Um, another thing that I, I know we're almost at time, but um, ask for feedback. And that's one thing that I did not do. Not that I thought it was that great. It's just, I was like, oh, wow, I didn't get, you know, like a callback or I didn't, um, it, it doesn't hurt to, to ask. Maybe you could have improved on something during your, your interview process. Maybe um, even if you're at an internship and they didn't give you a full-time offer um, there, and you're stuck between, you know, yourself and another candidate, you know, if you, if you were to say like, hey, you know, I appreciate any feedback. Um, how can I improve for next time? Like, what was the, you know, the the final sh the final item that was between me and this other candidate? Um, so I think I didn't do enough of that. Where self awareness and um, just being able to be open minded. Like, they're not saying that you're not great, but there's a lot of improvement in areas for everyone since no one's perfect. So definitely make sure you um, you ask for that feedback and make sure that you're open enough to to improve on it. Alrighty, uh, looks like we have about a minute left, but I just wanted to say thank you everyone for participating and talking about their stories today. Um, me personally, as a first generation student, I feel like I definitely learned a lot. 
from these. Um, being a, being a modder, I feel like I was attending this and um, learning from all your stories and experiences. And I definitely uh, can take this with me when I am applying for internships and um, learning from my interviews. Uh, I definitely feel like we should bring back the pamphlets and the bulletin boards. I think that's, those are really cool. Um, but uh, we would like to give a special thank you for all panelists once again and for sharing the personal stories. Um, please look for um, information on future identity talks on the ISD website. Um, our last one for this semester is military and veterans in tech on November 17th. Thank you all for coming and have a wonderful rest of your day.